Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. And I'm Adrian Arsenault. Tonight, the new video of a push that nearly ruined a perfect night. <laughs> the Raptors president initially accused of assault, but footage shows a very different story. Parliament prorogued. This is a cover-up. But will the we controversy remain? What new internal government documents reveal? The fast-moving wildfire in BC's Okanagan. We've never had a fire this close. Hundreds have fled. The story of one man who stayed behind as the flames closed in. Look at this. And they could be the luckiest couple in Canada. Wow, this, is, this can't be real. This is impossible. Winning the lottery not once, but twice. This is The National. At a time when interactions between police and people of color all over the world are under growing scrutiny, newly released video is shedding light on a high-profile confrontation. 14 months ago, Masai Ujiri, the president of the Toronto Raptors, was accused of shoving a California sheriff's deputy on a night that was supposed to be a celebration. Hard to forget the moment. The Toronto Raptors have just captured the NBA championship, a decisive victory in Game 6 against the Golden State Warriors. That's when Canada cranked up the volume and the party got started. But that glee slightly dampened by the allegations. Ujiri was never charged but wound up being sued for the man's injuries. Now, Ujiri's legal team has released new video which shows just who was the aggressor. Devin Haru takes us through it. Canada, the NBA title is yours! A championship moment, something Raptors president Masai Ujiri had always dreamt of, racing to the court when things turned sour. Security video from inside Oracle Arena shows Ujiri making his way through the crowd, nearly on the court when he reaches Alameda County Sheriff's deputy, Alan Strickland. A body camera worn by Strickland shows the altercation. Ujiri first shoved by Strickland, all while attempting to show his credentials, shoved a second time. Ujiri trying to explain he's the president of the Raptors before pushing back. The body cam video cuts out, but a wide shot shows the tense exchange broken up by bystanders before Ujiri finally gets on the court. You know, it, it probably ruins a, a night of... of um, tremendous celebration for Masai. Last February, Strickland filed a $75,000 lawsuit alleging he suffered injury to his head, body, and health. We wanted to see how injured he was. And our crews over three days um, saw him going out to lunch with his wife, carrying boxes. Local reporter Lisa Fernandez has covered the story since day one. <laughs> receiving the video Tuesday night from Ujiri's legal team. Ironically, it became public because he sued Mr. Ujiri. It probably wouldn't have become public otherwise. Ujiri has always maintained his innocence, as he did in this interview with The National. I'm only trying to celebrate, like, winning a championship. That's all I was trying to do, and I know the person that I am. In a statement, the Raptor said, we believe this video evidence shows exactly that Masai was not an aggressor. He's our best, and so I just am glad for him that this videotape has come out. As Mayor uh, Tory said, like, he was a good man. He robbed the moment from Masai. Scooped up by... But Ujiri might just get another chance to celebrate properly. The Raptors once again in the midst of a playoff run, trying to defend their title. Devin Haru, CBC News, Toronto. Well, newly released government documents give behind-the-scenes details of how the WE charity was chosen to run a student grants program. Justin Trudeau has put a temporary stop to question period by proroguing Parliament. But as David Cochran shows us, the opposition is not staying quiet. Parliament may be closed, MPs gone home, but the show must go on. Next page. Blacked out. This page. Blacked out. This page, blacked out. This page, blacked out. The Conservatives handpicked the heavily redacted pages from the thousands released by the government, but also unredacted ones they say prove a cozy relationship between the Liberals and the WE charity.
An April email from Mark Kielberger to the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Katie Telford, saying thank you for all that you and the Prime Minister do. A different email from a different Kielberger. From Craig to then Finance Minister Bill Morneau saying it was incredibly thoughtful of you to call. An email between civil servants from a senior official working for Morneau. We is connecting with my minister's office. They are all besties. The same official also wrote this. She, to start off with, says the Canada Student Service Grant is, quote, a bit of a shit show. At this point, that seems like an understatement. The student grants program is dead in the water with the WE charity fighting to survive. Bill Morneau has resigned and Parliament is prorogued until September. We have released all those documents to uh, the members of the committees so that they can uh, spend their time going through those uh, mountains of documents over the coming weeks so that they can continue to ask any questions they like on this issue. Okay, so David, the opposition found something to feast on in those documents. What about the government? Yeah, Andrew, also in those documents are numerous emails, memos that support the government's central defense in all this. Civil servants from across multiple departments saying the public sector simply couldn't deliver this grants program and that we was the best and only option to make it happen. Now, this is consistent throughout the timeline of the program design and its creation. And even when it all blew up, civil servants are, are writing each other, consoling each other, saying that this was still the right policy and program choice. It just turns out to have been a terrible political choice. Mm. And, and David, what does prorogation mean for the investigations? Yeah, so the ethics commissioner's work is totally unaffected by prorogation, and it's not going to stop because Morneau has quit either. So that continues. The committees, they're stopped dead until Parliament resumes. They're not allowed to hold hearings or call witnesses until after the throne speech. So the prime minister has bought himself some time here. The government is free from the distractions and pressure of committee hearings, at least for the next few weeks. And their hope is that the throne speech, which they say will be a roadmap out of the pandemic, will be significant enough to change the conversation entirely. Okay, David, we'll be listening. Thanks. Thank you. On this third night of the Democratic Party's national convention, women have been the focus. Stories from regular Americans and pleas from some famous ones, like Gabby Giffords, the former lawmaker who was shot at point-blank range while giving a public speech nearly 10 years ago. America needs all of us to speak out, even when you have to fight to find the words. But one woman's words are front and center tonight, one who's shattered a glass ceiling for black and brown women. Kamala Harris is accepting the party's nomination for vice president. Susan Ormerson has been following the story all week, and she's in Delaware. So, Susan, what did we hear from Kamala Harris? Yeah, a really historic night. Kamala Harris up there, the first black and South Asian woman to be nominated as vice president in the United States. She had to do a couple of things tonight. She had to introduce herself to Americans. She had to underline her loyalty to Joe Biden as the presidential candidate. And she needed to really speak to the crisis and what's facing America now. And here's what she said on that. So we're at an inflection point. The constant chaos leaves us adrift. The incompetence makes us feel afraid. The callousness makes us feel alone. And Susan, I gather Kamala Harris made a real plea for supporters to just get ready for a tough fight ahead. Yeah, she wasn't the only one. We heard that a lot from the uh, very high-profile speakers tonight, exhorting Democrats to really get out and vote like they never have before. You know, we expected maybe a little bit more of her prosecu prosecutorial nature uh, against Donald Trump. We didn't hear as much of that. We heard a more positive, uh, very warm approach from Kamala Harris, and again telling people, this is your time. Get out there and fight. Let's fight with conviction. Let's fight with hope. Let's fight with confidence in ourselves and a commitment to each other, to the America we know is possible. And so just before Harris, uh, former President Barack Obama spoke, what did he have to say? 
You know, he had some very sharp words for the president. Uh, he made sure that people were listening. He said the president didn't have any interest in the job that Barack Obama held with pride, that he wasn't up to the task. We really haven't heard this line of attack from Barack Obama before. Here's a sample. He has shown no interest in putting in the work, no interest in finding common ground, no interest in using the awesome power of his office to help anyone but himself and his friends. No interest in treating the presidency as anything but one more reality show that he can use to get the attention he craves. Tomorrow night, Joe Biden is up, and then he and Harris have to figure out how to campaign during this pandemic as Donald Trump continues to crisscross the country in person, Adrian. All right, thank you, Susan. Susan Ormiston in Wilmington, Delaware, tonight. Well, California is battling hundreds of fast-moving wildfires. Thousands of people were forced out of their homes across the state, which is under an emergency order tonight. Officials say many of the fires were sparked by lightning strikes over the past three days. Conditions could get worse due to a heat wave. In British Columbia, crews are scrambling to contain a growing wildfire in the Okanagan region. Hundreds have been forced from their homes, with nearly 4,000 more told to be ready to leave on short notice. Hot and dry conditions are fueling the fast-moving blaze southeast of Penticton, dubbed the Christie Mountain Fire. It broke out yesterday afternoon and has already grown to cover more than 14 square kilometers. Briar Stewart has the latest. For more than 24 hours, crews have been trying to contain a fire after it ignited a tinder dry hillside perched above Skaha Lake in the Okanagan. There was a very strong northerly wind. It probably moved three or four kilometers in the space of an hour and a half. It was very, very aggressive and it's above where our winery is. Which is why John Skinner shut it down yesterday afternoon and was thankful crews protected it by dropping fire retardant nearby. Late yesterday, a few hundred were told to leave their homes and a few thousand were put on evacuation alert. When you live in the Okanagan, you get a sense that this could happen one day to almost anybody, especially in our area. It's, it's a very treed uh, and, and not a very uh, populated area. So we have things packed ready to go. But as the fire roared through the night, some stayed behind. The noise, it was like a freight train going through it. This dramatic picture captured a homeowner looking for embers on his property as the fire burned behind. And there's embers all over the driveway, in the pool, on sidewalks, but um, just a sheer stroke of luck that they haven't ignited the grasslands around us. At least one home was destroyed as the wind pushed the fire closer to residential areas overnight. But today, a change in direction, which meant the fire started moving away from Okanagan Falls. However, the thick smoke remained a challenge for fire crews. So far, this fire season in B.C. has been relatively tame compared to years past, where dozens of fires led to huge swaths of the province under evacuation. But for the few hundred residents still out of their homes tonight, anxiety remains as long as the fire keeps burning out of control. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Turning now to the COVID situation across Canada. Today, Ontario reported more than 100 new cases for the second day in a row. Alberta announced 82, with Edmonton still accounting for more than half of the province's active cases. BC, meanwhile, reported 68 new cases, inching closer to 800 active ones. That's a new high for the province. Manitoba, too, has seen an uptick in the overall cases in the past month, but not everywhere. Today, the government rolled out a color-coded system to give residents a more targeted idea of where the risks are changing. Karen Pauls looks at how it works. It's a fearful time for all of us. These fears are real. Today's announcement is in part a way to address those fears. Premier Brian Pallister says COVID. most of the province is in yellow, which means the spread of COVID-19 is low to moderate. Life is relatively normal, but with physical distancing in place. The next level is restricted, which is orange. At restricted, we're seeing increased community transmission. The chief medical health officer says he may clusters. raise it to orange in Brandon because of a cluster connected to a food plant. 
Red means widespread outbreaks and a return to lockdown conditions. At this point, we'd see serious strains on our health care system. Right now, one personal care home is listed as red. There have been questions about what would change a rating. Rusin says he'll consider five criteria, infection rates and community transmission, the number of available ICU beds and PPE, the ability of public health to do tests and contact tracing, outbreaks in personal care homes, and the number of travel-related cases. Some Winnipeggers give the measures a thumbs up. It's a green zone, so we are safe, right? But if it's in a coming orange zone or in, like in the middle one, so at least people will be more aware, and I think it's a good idea. The more information people have about where they're going and where they're traveling, the more information is better. This expert says the simple messaging is effective. We need an engaged population because we're still going to need tremendous community buy-in as this pandemic unfolds. In Manitoba, the goal is to stay in yellow because we won't get to green until there's an effective treatment or vaccine. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, as the school year approaches, a surprising number of families are choosing online studies for their kids. At the country's largest board in Toronto, 29% of elementary students will learn outside the classroom. Deanna Sumanak Johnson shows us what that may look like. I don't have an email app. When 14-year-old Drake goes back to school, it'll be online. Ultimately, uh, he just decided that he wasn't comfortable. But it'll be a lot different than it was in the spring. To embrace what parents want and really ultimately what students deserve, which is a quality, consistent, live, synchronous learning experience, Zoom-style classroom province-wide. That means a teacher and a group of students interacting in real time. I think the synchronous learning uh, allows a little bit more support uh, and conversation. In many larger school boards in Ontario, remote instruction will also be centralized, taught by teachers who specialize in online learning and don't go near a classroom. You wouldn't be essentially attending your own school, you'd be attending the TDSB virtual school. Uh, with its own staff but, it is but not everyone is a fan i really would have liked especially for my son who's been with the same cohort all through high school for him to at least have a bit of a cohort uh within his school even though he was learning from home but uh it doesn't look like that's happening now Toronto is not the only school board touting the benefits of the centralized approach. In the Calgary Catholic School District, they have an online school with 3,000 students signed up so far. And in Regina Public Schools, online instructors will all work from the same location. They will be working together. They'll also benefit from working together with their colleagues so they can share information, uh, they could share uh, tips and tricks. But even with these changes, some older issues with online learning remain. I work from home uh, so that I'm, I can support him if he needs it. Um, but that's not always the case for, for everybody. Uh, so I, I think addressing that inequality is, is definitely in, important. <laughs> Whether it's completely ready or not, online learning rolls out in just a few weeks. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. And Canada has joined a growing chorus of condemnation for the leaders of a military coup in Mali. As Sasha Petrosek tells us, it has left the West African nation teetering on the brink of chaos. The celebration continues in Mali's capital, Bamako. Crowds cheering, soldiers triumphant after ousting President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. Over at the presidential villa, Young people now splash in the presidential pool. Kaito was last seen publicly reading his resignation, then crying after being kicked out of office at gunpoint. He himself took power in the wake of a coup seven years ago. La vraie démocratie. This time, the soldiers seem to have widespread support. What the military did was not a coup d'état, he says. What they did was support the people in their suffering. Public anger grew recently as police cracked down on protests, as the economy crumbled, as the government failed to end an Islamist insurgency in Mali's north, which has dragged on for years, and as corruption continued. So you had a mass movement calling for the resignation of the president since June, uh, organized by uh, leaders of political parties, religious leaders and civil society organizations campaigning against corruption. So far, though, the international community doesn't see this as a democratic victory. 
Secretary General strongly condemned the military mutiny. The coup was condemned by the UN Security Council today and in most Western capitals, including Ottawa. Indeed, it complicates things for a large force of international troops in Mali who've been fighting against Islamist insurgents allied with Al Qaeda. Hundreds of Canadian soldiers were part of that UN mission last year. About 10 remain. Now, despite promises by coup leaders that they will hand power back to civilians soon, no one really knows who will be running Mali. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Toronto. Well, the number of COVID-19 deaths in Mexico have skyrocketed, making it the third worst in the world. The response from the government has been, well, let's just resign ourselves to the fact that lots of people are going to die of this. Up next, why that number could actually be way higher. Plus, no crowds, no parties, and a bunch of Republicans. It is a Democratic convention like no other. Is this enough to resonate with American voters? Our U.S. politics panel is standing by. And imagine hitting the lotto twice. I thought he was kidding me. How one couple's double lottery luck helps another family keep their business going through the pandemic. We're back in two. Welcome back. Although the pandemic may be slowing in some countries, the number of new cases globally is growing faster than ever. More than 22 million cases are confirmed worldwide. The U.S. remains the hardest hit with more than five and a half million infections. But Latin America has quickly emerged as a major battleground for the pandemic. Five countries are among the 10 hardest hit, with the region surpassing the six million case mark over the weekend. Stephen D'Souza takes us to Mexico, where the pandemic has taken aim at the country's most vulnerable. Isabel Vasquez remembers the final moments of her mother's struggle with COVID-19, how the pain was too much to endure. In June, her mother went to hospital with an intestinal infection. The family believes she contracted the virus during her treatment. It was very painful when they told me that news, she says. My mother cried out, no more. Their suburb of Mexico City has been hit especially hard. Seven people on their street have died. A lot of people continue as if nothing is happening because they haven't lived it firsthand like we have lived it. Mexico has more than half a million cases and is third in the world in deaths with close to 60,000. But the fear is that number is actually two to three times higher because mass testing is rare in Mexico. Kiosks like this set up by Mexico City's mayor are the exception rather than the rule. It's a challenge to try to convince a patient who may have minimal symptoms to go and get tested and seek early medical attention. Adding to that challenge, President Andres Manuel López Obrador. He rarely wears a mask, argues testing isn't necessary, and says prayer and good luck charms will protect him. Experts say Mexico's lax approach is a calculated risk because the country's economy is in large part made up of poor, unregulated workers who can't afford shutdowns and quarantines. I think it, it's been a little haphazard. However, um, I would say that in essence, they didn't really have all that many choices. Another challenge, a fear of hospitals, rooted in historic mistrust of doctors and an often inadequate public health care system. There'll be another uh, increase again. Canadian doctor Mandeep Dillon works at a public hospital east of Mexico City. I think it, it almost seems as though um, the response from the government has been, well, let's just resign ourselves to the fact that lots of people are going to die of this and at some point, you know, we'll be through it. The country's health minister claims this week that the worst may be over, saying the outlook is positive, a clear downward slope. But that's a small comfort in a country where, like so many places, the poor are paying the highest cost, and the virus's true toll may not be known for months or years to come. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. Next on The National, trying to drum up excitement without a convention for the U.S. Democratic Party needs to hype up voters and get some key demographics out to the polls. Can they do it? Well, these are the people to ask. Our U.S. political panel is standing by right after this. The first 15 words of our Constitution are, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. 
Some sound there from the third night of the Democratic National Convention. In the year of COVID-19, this key piece of campaign 2020 theater is as non-traditional as the current U.S. political landscape. But just because it's virtual doesn't reduce its real purpose. Tonight, that's to introduce to the country the party's historic choice for vice president and to whip up support for the Biden-Harris ticket. And so to talk about how that's going so far, I am joined by David Frum, a senior editor at The Atlantic. Nadia E. Brown is a political scientist and associate professor at Purdue University. And Howard Dean is a former head of the DNC, former governor of Vermont, and was a candidate for the Democratic nomination in 2004. And therefore, Governor, we need to start with you. No one knows this moment better than you. How do you think the Democrats will end up measuring success from a convention, well, let's just call it unique? Well, there's only one way to measure success, and that's if we win or in November or not. Uh, and everything, is, everything in politics and medicine, my two disciplines, are seen through the, what we call the retrospectoscope, which is unforgiving. Um, but I do think that conventions will look a lot more like this in the future, no matter what happens. COVID has simply accelerated some changes that were going to happen in any case, and I think there's going to be a lot more of this in the future. Nadia, what do you what do you think the Democrats absolutely have to do this week? Sure. Democrats really need to start to lay the road to unify the party. So really bringing back progressives who are um, not as enthusiastic about Biden as a candidate, but are more pragmatic about getting Trump out of the White House. And then bringing in some of the never Trumpers, right? Folks that do not think that the country is in the right place or going in the right direction. So the Democratic Party really needs to pitch this big tent and invite all the people back together and figure out what to do once Biden is elected and try to lay out this ground game um, this week. Okay, so so far in this in this convention, uh, most of the speeches, you know, have represented a bit of a piling on of, of insults and criticisms of Trump. Is there a chance, David, that the Democrats are just going to insult voters who once voted for Trump, who, who may be hesita hesitating this time around, the, the voters the Democrats want? Um, I don't think this election is going to be decided in the middle. I think this election is going to be decided by activation. Um, the, people know what they think of Donald Trump. He is the most opinion-driving president probably in our lifetimes. Uh, so the people who like him, like him, they're not going to change their minds. The people who don't, don't, and won't, they won't change their minds. The question is, do people feel that their voting can make a difference? Can they be activated? W one more thing, and I think both Nadia and the, the governor made this point, it's very important. What you're watching here is the first convention of the Facebook era. Uh, conventions used to be the last thing that was macro-targeted. Everybody saw the same show from whenever it started, 8 o'clock till 11 o'clock, whenever it quit. What, what the Democrats are doing is making a series of YouTube videos that can be algorithmically plugged into different people's feeds. So progressives who want to uh, be reassured about that will, will be seeing a very different Democratic convention over the next couple of months than for Trump Republicans who are reluctant, and then ma mainstream Democrats each will see different snippets, different elements of something that for the first time is being micro-targeted instead of macro-targeted. Okay, well, let, let's talk about those different elements. You know, Nadia, there, there's... You know, there is obviously, there's this talk of this tussle between the progressive left and the centrist views. Will it ultimately matter, do you think, what Biden's plans are? Or is the only policy that, that matters right now that, that he is not Donald Trump? No, no. Policies matter. Policies matter really big for millennials and Gen Z. Mm -hmm. um, this is a group of people who want to do more than just show up to vote someone out of office, which they are motivated by, but they want to know who they're voting for and why. And we've seen much more engagement um, and kind of a pushback of symbolic politics in um, an effort to talk more about the substance of how actual politicians are panning to deal with the issues. And so tonight we've already seen Gen Z's and millennials' issues right up front. Right leading off tonight was a discussion around uh, senseless gun violence and Gen, Gen Z's really leading the discussion here and what Biden will do to try to cut down on some of these senseless laws that have enabled millions of Americans, particularly black and brown communities, to be killed um, at gun, gun violence. So yeah, it's not just um, having a black woman, uh, multi-ethnic multi black woman as a VP, but it's also what, what are the substance that, that these candidates bring to the table. 
I think one of the things that, that's been noticeable at this convention is, is seeing a lot of big-name Republicans, uh, John Kasich, Cindy McCain, Colin Powell. Governor, what is, what's the thinking there? What are the chances that, that those people appearing will pull people across? They aren't going to pull people. What they're doing is giving permission for Republicans who are very uncomfortable with Trump, the so-called never-Trumpers. There are a group of people, um, and David certainly knows more about this than I do as a conservative, but there are a lot of people who really think Trump is dishonest, which he is, and who's doing America a disservice and, act, frankly, doing the cause of conservatism a disservice. And by having people like Cindy McCain and Colin Powell and John Kasich, who's a genuine conservative, talking at the Democratic convention, it gives people who, Republicans who don't want to vote for Trump permission to vote for this Democrat. And it's very, very important to us. This is going to be a one or two percent election in a lot of important states, and that could give us the margin. So, you know, I'm not sure that there's a, a lot to, to see or, or motivated a virtual convention unless you're a political junkie. I mean, it's, it's likely not high-impact viewing. So, Nadia, to start with you, and then we'll go to David, what does that say to you about the campaigns to come? Sure. Well, I think that, again, this is, this is the new era, right? We will see more campaigns and conventions look like this, particularly for digital natives, millennials, and Gen Zs, who are not going to be tuning in to the traditional um, format. But, right, the people that are tuning in are not, um, you know, these are people that are mostly partisans, people that are political science nerds, um, are really into policy. It's not your average citizen. Your average citizen will be catching this um, on the nightly news or in their curated news feed based on their demographics. So this convention, um, it will really play out differently for different people because the segments will be targeted for people based on their demographics and the likelihood that they, that group will turn out to vote. David? Um, I think the Democrats have backed into it. I think this is a very high impact convention, but in a completely new way. And the Democrats didn't do this on purpose. COVID drove it. But over the coming weeks, what's going to happen is if you are um, a, min a minority woman who wonders, is, is my vote effective? You're going to see snippets of that Michelle Obama speech showing up in your feed. Um, if you are a Midwestern conservative who's unhappy with Trump, and Facebook knows that, you're going to be seeing bits of John Kasich. And all of these things are going to be chopped into pieces and shown again and again and again. And that, that's why this really is the future. I, I think the days of people starting their viewing at 8 p.m. and watching all the way through to the last balloon drop, that probably is never coming back. But the ability to create specific videos for specific audiences, knowing who wants what, um, that's going to be very, very powerful. And I think, as I say, it's an accident. No one planned this. But I think they've discovered something, and it's going to be the future. By the way, David, people um, continue to worry about the integrity of the mail-in ballot systems in the United States. How much of a concern do you think that should be to either party? Um, I, I think this is going to be unprecedentedly for the, um, for the past 100 years, an election in which people do have to worry about the security of the voting system. Um, in 19th century America, there was a lot of vote rigging, a lot of ballot stuffing, a lot of cheating. Um, that has that began to go out of style in the 20th century, and now it is back and with a vengeance. Um, it's something really to worry about. All right, last question to each of you very briefly. We'll start with you, Nadia. What are you looking to see from Joe Biden tomorrow? I'm looking to see how it's going to roll out the policy preferences, how is it going to try to unite the party. Okay. That was pretty quick. Uh, David? Um, I'm going to see whether he can... Joe Biden is a creature of the Senate. He's always been a creature of hand-to-hand, handshaking politics, glad to see a big hug. Can he project himself through the camera um, and make that connection that is so essential to his politics with hundreds of millions of people. And that's going to be a question for him tomorrow night. All right, last word to you, Governor. Two things. He, he has to project what he's really selling, which is decency. I think people are tired of the corruption, tired of the narcissism, and they'd like some competence. Those are the three things. That's the meta message of Joe Biden's campaign. And I do think Nadia made an incredibly good point. One of our core, cons our three core constituencies are women, people of color, and people under 35. People under 35 don't have party, party loyalty. They have issues loyalty. And he has to talk about the things that he needs to talk about. And the alliance between him and Bernie Sanders is really significant. We have not seen that before. 
Um, and it's very, very important because we, he's got to speak directly about what he's going to do about climate change, uh, particularly diversity. Uh, those are things that the younger generation cares a great deal about. Uh, and they will vote for Democrats as long as we're there because the Republicans aren't. But if we stray from that, uh, then it's just another candidate and we're going to lose them and we can't lose them because we can't beat Trump if we do. All right, Governor, thanks very much. Thank you to Nadia E. Brown, David Frum, Governor Dean. Thank you. Okay, and when we come back, we return to Canadian politics. The race to lead the Conservative Party is on. We'll take a closer look at one of the candidates. Plus... A nice looking check. Imagine winning the lottery twice. How this couple's big win has already helped a struggling business. I was so sick of the fact that there was hundreds of people in Walmart, uh, you know, people out demonstrating, and yet our churches were closed. Churches, I think we can all agree, should be an essential service. That's Derek Sloan, a Conservative MP from Ontario who's running to lead his party into the next election. He's the fourth candidate we're profiling this week, ahead of Sunday's final vote counts to determine the winner. So let's learn some more about Sloan and the issues he would focus on as Conservative leader. Derek Sloan says he doesn't want to be just another face in the crowd. Derek Sloan's here. He's ready to rumble. And uh, he, uh, he's a no-apologies conservative. Sloan's only been in Ottawa for a short time, elected just last fall, but he's wasted no time in sticking out. Just days after announcing his intention to run for the party leadership, he suggested in a tweet that while being gay is not a choice, it's something science needs to figure out. Today, I'd like to focus my remarks on the Public Health Agency of Canada's guidance for schools. Then he questioned the patriotism of Canada's Chief Public Health Officer, Dr. Theresa Tam. Theresa Tam, uh, we sent an email out today asking, does she work for Canada or for China? Which eventually drew rebuke from the leader Sloan hopes to replace. And I believe it is, uh, it is not appropriate to question someone's loyalty to their country. I believe that is a, a very a serious uh, accusation that you have to have some uh, very substantial evidence to make. Despite being asked to apologize for those comments by some MPs in his own party, Sloan refused, a bedrock stance he carried right into the debates. Mr. Sloan, you have 60 seconds. I will never give an inch to political correctness. I won't cede an ounce of our sovereignty to international organizations. I'm the only candidate that is committed to defunding the World Health Organization and getting Canada out of the Paris Agreement. Sloan was a small business owner in southern Ontario before obtaining a law degree. He is a social conservative and believes Canada is becoming more socially conservative. But I do believe that, that new Canadians are more socially conservative. They're more traditional in their views. And I think we can speak to that in ways that are intelligible and helpful. That message has resonated with Sloan's hardcore supporters. But it's unclear whether that base of support is wide enough to propel Sloan to victory. Bashi Capellos, CBC News, Ottawa. Now we need to note a correction from our profile of Leslin Lewis yesterday. In the profile, we said Lewis was the only candidate who is not an MP. Peter McKay is a former MP. Lewis is, however, the only candidate to have never been a member of Parliament. It was also stated that Lewis, if successful, will be the first black woman to head a federal political party in Canada. In fact, Vivienne Barbeau briefly served as interim leader of the Bloc Québécois in 2011. We want to take a moment to remember an iconic Canadian columnist, renowned writer Alan Fotheringham, has died. I can't stand phoniness and hypocrisy, so I bash them on the head. That's my job. Newspaper columnist Alan Fotheringham was Canadian journalism royalty. Can be pseudo-glamorous in a certain way, but only for a time span. With 40 years of sharp edge satire and prolific opinions to share. Reminded me of a man sort of halfway out on the diving board. It's obvious they want an excuse for an election. If you are to remain credible. From tiny Hearn, Saskatchewan, he became a thorn in the side of politicians countrywide. We view the words of politicians with uh, some, uh, some doubt. <laughs> Always saving some scorn for his own profession. No one could ever accuse him of holding anything back. As an institution, the press can dish it out, but it can't take it. It's front page. Fotheringham was a frequent contributor to CBC, and in the 1980s, he became a regular panelist on the network's longest running entertainment show. 
Fotheringham retired from weekly journalism in 2007, but he kept writing. What made him good? In his own opinion, it was pretty simple. I'm a good listener. The most scarce commodity in the world is a good listener. You'd be amazed what people tell you. Alan Fotheringham was 87. A difficult truth about COVID-19, it's exposed racial disparities in Canada and around the world. In Quebec, the government promised to start collecting race-based data. Many believe it's the only way to get targeted help to those who need it, but the province hasn't followed through. So as Alison Northcott explains, a group in Montreal is doing it themselves. So I'm logging into the Color of COVID website. Thierry Lindor hopes this site can help show who in Montreal is getting sick from COVID-19. He lost friends and family to the virus in the U.S. And for me, it became very intimate to kind of try to dive in and say, well, how come it seems that it's affecting black and brown communities a lot more? Despite saying it would this spring, Quebec isn't collecting race-based data. So Lindor, an entrepreneur, and several community groups say they will do it themselves. 83% of people that contracted COVID in Toronto precisely were either black or uh, uh, people of color. So what, what does that mean for Montreal? This voluntary two-minute survey asks people about their experiences with COVID. The groups hope the information can be used to tailor the pandemic response in the most vulnerable communities. It's the ability to collect this data and share it with funders, foundations, and governments, all levels of government, say, this is what we've seen on the ground. Now, what are you going to do? The ball is in your court. How do you respond to what we were able to collect without your support. Lindor acknowledges there are limitations to this kind of voluntary survey, but says it will still produce useful information. The data seems to all say the same thing. Racialized populations are at much higher risk of COVID-19. This expert says although this survey might not be able to paint a full picture, it's a chance for communities to tell their stories. If communities are able to say that they're finding high rates of COVID in their own populations, even if the data is not perfect, well, then that's better than nothing. But he says it can't replace other properly organized and properly funded data collection. Quebec's health ministry did not respond to a request for comment. When the government doesn't act, the people should act. And they say they will do what they can with the resources they have. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Well, next, a lucky couple in Cape Breton is celebrating a crazy stroke of luck, their second lottery win. It's still mind-boggling. It's still difficult to put my head around it to think just how much it is. But they're not the only winners. How it's already helping their community. Next. In Cape Breton tonight, a winning lottery ticket is being celebrated by two families. That's Gay and Raymond Lillington, who bought it. They won more than 17 million bucks. And here are Alicia and James McAvoy. They own the store that sold the winning ticket. Now, you might think, what else is there to say? That's the whole story right there, right? Well, this one has two twists, one surprising and one quite powerful. Combined, they are our moment. Totally shocked because I really, really, really didn't expect to win. That disbelief started with the ticket. I thought he was kidding me, but when I saw the look on his face, the, oh no, here we go again, it's, it's real. <laughs> yeah, you heard right, again. You see, seven years ago, the Lillingtons cashed a $3 million ticket. They plan to travel, but also to help hospitals and stores in their community. Because they're there for us, and then we like to be there for them. And help is just what the McAvoys needed. They worried their store, located on the Cabot Trail, might not survive COVID. It couldn't have happened at a better time because the tour season is non-existent this year. But selling this ticket brings in 175000 bucks, Enough for some upgrades and... Well, a small community like this, if we can keep four more staff on for the winter, that's like a big area keeping 200 people in business. A win-win for a community and, of course, for the lucky couple. So the old me would have thought, after you win the lottery, stop buying lottery tickets, but the new me doesn't know what to think. Listen, saving the best <laughs> for last here. 
Very lucky store. Uh, in 2013, it sold a $3 million winning ticket. Guess who it sold it to? Get out. That couple. Really? Mm -hmm. That is a national for Wednesday, August 19th. <laughs> Good night. Good night.